Hello, this is Audiobug, and welcome to a reading of r slash Entitled People. Story 1 My elderly dad was just screaming at me because I don't want to take him to his appointments on my birthday. I have been caretaking for my elderly father after my mom's passing. He has some health needs, and my mom passed away unexpectedly several years ago. I have put a lot of my own life aside to step in and help him. That gets my better judgment because he is ultimately a narcissist in a lot of ways. He can be very verbally abusive and obviously I am to blame for continuing to help him even though he acts like this. My birthday is next week and he had mentioned he wants to schedule one of his appointments that day and also his haircut after we go to lunch. I told him that I would rather him pick a different day and that I really want to take that day to myself to not be taking him to appointments. The haircut is not urgent, and that really could be done any day. And then he started screaming at me, saying, why can't you take half an hour to take me that day? I already told him because I might be making plans for my friend that afternoon, and he started screaming at me, that is stupid, you can't take me. That is the one day a year that I really want to take to myself. I help him all the time. I'm the primary one to take him to all the appointments in general, and I really don't want to be taking him places that day, and he's already making me feel bad for it. Like I said, I know that I need to set boundaries for myself, and I really need to actually enforce them and not always fall back into the tendency of helping again, even after he screams at me or is disrespectful. The haircut itself might not seem like a big deal, but I just genuinely don't want to. I want to leave that day open for things I want to do. Yeah, the dad sounds just terribly abusive of the story. Take the day to yourself. I mean, you could maybe even hire a caretaker for your dad. There doesn't seem to be a reason why you need to be the one doing it. Let's see what the comments have to say. I did the same with my narcissistic elderly mother after my father passed. I pray your story doesn't end up like mine. I stay with my mother for three years, doing everything, and I do mean everything around the house. She would get on the phone and complain to others that she couldn't get me to help her. She didn't know I overheard this. She was also very volatile. In the meantime, I was getting more depressed from her negativity. One day, she exploded and attacked me physically. Then, she called the police on me, claiming elderly abuse. She went to jail because I was trying to get away from her. She hit me by lower back with a step stool when my back was turned. Of course, I didn't want her to go to jail. I pleaded with them not to take her. But one officer stopped me and asked why I was pleading for her not to be taken to jail when she was perfectly fine trying to send me there. I moved the next day. After that, I simply visit twice a month and do what I can. Their cup is always going to be completely empty because they take so much from you and it's never enough. Try to protect yourself emotionally and physically, please. Other comments. I can't believe I'm saying this, but that was one good cop. Maybe one good apple will spoil the bunch? If ugly, the reverse is true. I don't know. Maybe the good cops will outnumber the bad eventually. Next story. Story 2 person expecting me to give them my earnings for a charity cause. Years ago, I thought Zumba classes, where there was a tragedy or someone was in need, often a bunch of instructors from around town would get together and do a zumba -thon to raise money. I used to co-teach at a church and the classes were very well attended, like two classes per night, twice a week, with 100 to 150 people per class. Every once in a while, the church would ask us to do a fundraiser, and we usually just announced ahead of time that we were donating that night's receipts to the church in case people wanted to contribute extra. One woman called me because she was part of a walkathon or something where you put a team together and the team raises money together to donate to the overall cause. She wanted me to donate the money we earned from a regular class to give to her for our charity. I explained that we are happy to do fundraisers for groups, but they have to provide the venue and participant. We will promote their event in our classes and teach for free, but it was their event. She didn't like this, 
She figured since we do it for the church that hosted our classes, we should do it for her too. I pointed out to her that this was my job and how I earned money to eat and pay my bills. She knew my co-instructor was a teacher, so she said she talked to her since she had another job. I asked her if she already asked everyone else she knew to donate a day's wages to her cause. She was not happy with me. It still astounds me that this person decided the way to donate to a cause was to make someone else do all the work and sacrifice. Yeah, that is pretty common with charity donations, though. Depends, like, if they can, like, get other people to do it for them, they usually do. Let's see what the comments have to say. Many years ago, there was a company-wide email where I was working at the time. Some employee was going to walk the Great Wall of China, but they needed $2,000, I forget the exact figure, before they started. I did assume to cover getting there, accommodation, etc. I didn't know the employee, neither did anyone at our location, so none of us responded. The following day a response, again company-wide, arrived, some pointing out that in fact the original person was, in effect, asking strangers, us, to fund their holiday. No one knew the person who responded either. There is an aggravated reply from the OP, but the upshot was that all charity efforts had to be approved by HR before asking colleagues for money. More comments. There is an aggravated reply from OP, but the upshot was that all charity efforts had to be approved by HR before asking colleagues for money. I'm surprised this person didn't get into massive trouble, especially for the second email. Me too, honestly. Walking the Great Wall to what end? Do you have other people pay a cab to walk through cents a mile, like some charity runs? Or was it to just say he did it? And yes, I'm aware that less than 10% of the wall remains intact. It's a bit of a farcical goal. Yeah, it sounds like they were just trying to trick people with that one more than the other ones. Unless they had like a lot of people. Who knows? Next story. Story 3. My entitled father-in-law suggested he sees me as a great guard for his son. Disclaimer. Yup, it's me and I'm back. If you know my father-in-law post, then you know the story. I'll try and find a way to attach the post for those who haven't seen my post about my future father-in-law. I'm so calling my therapist as soon as I get back into the US after all of this. I met my fiancé two years ago. And for us, it's just instant love. He's Korean, and I'm white, so we do have a bit of cultural differences. Besides that, the only real problem we have is that my fiancé had to go back to South Korea to renew a visa, and sadly, he got denied. So we've proceeded with the K-1 fiancé visa, since we met all the requirements and our immigration lawyer advised us it would be good for us. We got approved, and his interview is September 12th. Then I'll come back to New York in October. It has been hard with the long distance, but luckily I got to visit him in Korea for two and a half weeks. On a side note, his parents are very wealthy. I love and respect his parents, but they get under my skin. During this trip, my father-in-law made comments about my diet and how I need to eat healthier. We only share meals together a few times, and when we do, we all eat the same thing, but I eat at a smaller portion. I'm 4'11 and weigh 118 pounds, but I was recently diagnosed with high blood pressure. My dad has said it's so it's part of my sucky genetics, but my father-in-law doesn't get the part that it's genetics and he has been making rude comments this whole time I'm here. There's been other things he said that got under my skin, but I know you all don't have time to hear it lol. During lunch, he told me that he's so lucky that his son found me so he has easy access to the United States. I was confused and asked him what he meant, and he said, it's so hard to get into the United States, but now, because of you, he has full access to the United States. I took that as his father sees me as an easy way for his son to get a green card. It took me a lot to not start crying. My father-in-law also went on a rant that I need to learn Korean, that he expects his grandchildren to know Korean, which I understand it's important, but my fiancé and I are not there yet. He also made rude comments about how my fiancé changed his major from aviation to data science. I've been hearing those comments since last December. It's like they never tell his son any of this, but they tell me. He then went again off by saying how much money they lost 
due to the career change. I told him, I get that you lost money, and I won't understand that, but I just want your son to do whatever makes him happy. I just don't know if I'm being used for a green card. The love I have for my fiancé is so unconditional, and I know how much he loves me. I can feel the love, and I've never felt love like that before. But I'm so curious. What do y'all think? Should I tell my fiancé what his dad said about how he knows how to have easy cracks as to the U.S. because of me? Yeah, I think discussing it with your fiancé, maybe, so we can have a talk with his dad. Doesn't sound like the son believes it, but sounds like the dad's just kind of unsupportive. Let's see what the comments have to say. You need to sit down with your fiancé and lay everything out. When my husband and I were getting serious, the topic of immigration and visas was very much a part of the discussion. If you can't have an open dialogue with your partner about visas and what that means for both of you, as well as any cultural issues, you need to put the brakes on until you can. Seriously considering premarital counseling with someone who has worked with people from different cultures. If you put the work in now to lay a really good foundation, it'll help guide you as a couple when issues arise. If you're planning on getting married, now is the time to talk about expectations about what marriage looks like to each of you. You should be talking about if you want children and how you want to raise them before you get married. If your relationship is strong, it can stand the test of waiting a little to make sure you are both on the same page and have a solid base going into marriage. Other comments. 100% agree with this. Also, my friend, you seem to give a bit too much of a care what these people say and think, or what you think they think. May I suggest some therapy for yourself to do with giving less of a care about other people's stupid judgments. If you have difficulty doing it for your own sake, Maybe you consider it invested in being a better and more confident parent where you get to that point. I'll put it this way because you seem like someone who might think that being good for you is not a good enough reason. Hint, it definitely is. She is young and has been with these horrible future in-laws for weeks who have been picking on her relentlessly. Of course she is bothered by that. Once they are married, they will live in the U.S. far away from them. But right now, it seems she is drowning and her fiancé isn't doing much to help. But from what little I know about Asian culture, the in-laws will be moving to the U.S. because the son and his wife are expected to take care of them. Yeah, that could happen, like, depending on the culture. So, might be good to deal with that now. Or just not let them live with you. Depends what the son feels, too. Really, they just need to have a conversation. Next story. Story 4. Entitled couple plan a photo shoot at my gazebo. I, 50 female, rent a place along a river in Ontario, Canada, every year in August for 10 to 14 days. My rental includes exclusive use of a cabin, private deck with hot tub, and a furbished gazebo. Mine is the only rental with a gazebo. Just east of my place is another smaller cabin with just a dock and a hot tub. I get back from a quick grocery shopping expedition. As I am unpacking my car, a young woman, entitled woman, walks over and climbs onto my deck. She has obviously either just showered or just gone out of the hot tub. She's in a bathrobe. Entitled woman, hi, I just wanted to stop by and tell you that me and my partner will be doing a photo shoot at the gazebo tomorrow morning. Just letting you know, as a courtesy, since we will be moving your boats out for the photo shoot. Don't worry, we will put them back. Now, the gazebo is attached to a deck which surrounds my rental cabin. My kayaks are in the gazebo when rain is forecast. It's been raining on and off all day. Now, I have exclusive use of the entire area. No one from the other rentals are supposed to come near my area. This info is part of the owner's orientation for all new arrivals. I'm standing at my cabin door, with grocery bags in hands, dumbfounded that she thinks she can take over my gazebo that is part of my rental. Entitled woman. So are you staying alone, or do you have your husband and kids with you? Do you own the cabin? How much did it cost? How long have you been here? Bullet quick questions, no pauses for answers. Me. You are in my private space. Please leave. Entitled woman. I'm just being friendly. Me. No, you are intruding on my space and invading my privacy. 
Your questions are intrusive and creepy. You'll be not doing a photo shoot tomorrow or any time in my gazebo. Please leave now. Entitled woman, no need to get snippy, she says in a snippy tone. We are doing this shoot tomorrow, so you better not interfere. Given your attitude, I think it's best that you head into town by 8. Do not come back before 2. Me. Not happening. Get off my deck. Get out of my space now. Entitled woman, stamping her foot. You are being unreasonable. You're the only one with a gazebo. You need to share. Me. No, I don't. Leave now. I went into the cabin, locked the doors, and immediately messaged the owner. I've been renting here for years, and the owner and I have become friends. They didn't show up for their photo shoot, and the owner had to chase them out of the rental the next morning. They are still in bed an hour past checkout time. Man, yeah, they're one of those people who thinks they could just bulldoze their way into using things other people paid for. Probably just too cheap to, like, ask politely or offer the payment or just be considerate in any way. Or just pay for it themselves. Let's see what the comments have to say. Calling the owner was the right thing to do. Glad they backed you up. One of those occasions that who you know definitely benefits you. So, like most occasions, I can't think of any single scenario where knowing someone with power is detrimental. So I say all occasions. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Next story. Story 5. Age restrictions aren't my problem. I work in what is essentially a huge play place for children. There are no age restrictions except for one single room, which is limited to children under the age of three. It also requires them to be supervised by a member of their group age 16 or older because we are just there to facilitate play and make sure everyone is being safe. We are not babysitters. Everyone's staff included is required to have their shoes off when in the room. We don't want dirt, mud, etc. being trapped into a room where a lot of little kids are crawling around on the floor. We deal with people being mildly annoyed over these rules on a pretty regular basis, but typically they don't make a big thing of it. Recently a mom came up to the little entrance gate to the room with her two kids. One was younger than three, the other was very obviously at least six or five years old. Before I can even say hello, she is telling me, not even asking, that the five to six year old will be coming into the room regardless of the rules because she doesn't have anyone else who can watch him and her younger child really wants to come in. I politely try to explain that I can't allow that. We take the age rule very seriously due to past issues and we can get written up for allowing bigger kids into the room. She makes a huge show of groaning and rolling her eyes at me, and then tells the older child that he can just go play somewhere else while she and the under three come play in the room, requiring me to tell her that she absolutely cannot have her kids off on their own without her. She then proceeds to flip off at me. Every time we've come here, I've been allowed to bring my older child in here with me. No one's ever told us that was a rule before, and so on. I explained to her if that was true, my coworkers had made a mistake, and I was fully expected to maintain the age limits on the room. She gets angrier and angrier and ends up goading her youngest into a full on crying meltdown by telling him, This person is saying, You don't get to have fun. If he's not letting us in, then we have to go home, because I just can't deal with both of you. It all wrapped up with both of her kids crying as they're being shoved back into their stroller and the mob storming off swearing as she was going to go straight to her admissions desk to report me and that she was going home to write a review. I asked around later and found out that she did go to the front desk to complain and that was apparently utterly livid when she was told, yeah, sounds like our employee did their job. That room is exclusively for kids three or younger and we do require that kids stay with their adults. She still hasn't left a review though. I was looking forward to seeing my date mentioned. Yeah, that's just crazy dangerous to just ignore the rules at a place like that. A lot of little kids can get hurt because, like, slightly older kids might not know how to be gentle. And that's not their fault, it's just, like, need supervision. Let's see what the comments have to say. My favorite businesses are the ones who take crazy negative reviews like that lady will ultimately write. 
I blow them up into huge posters and put them on the wall for everyone to see. Or advertise saying stuff like, come try the burger at Yelp or 12, said it's the worst ever, a judge for yourself. Love it. Saw one of those not long ago for the worst coffee ever. I thought it was brilliant. I do passive aggressive clapbacks on my Google reviews and all my other customers love it. Aw, that sounds like such a fun way to engage with the community. Well, this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.